virus. Professor Jaoko is going to talk about the COVID-19 vaccines and virus uh, mutations. As you are aware, uh, colleagues, there are quite, uh, Africa is currently worried because of the detection of the various uh, uh, coronavirus mutants, some of which are considered to be of high concern and uh, therefore threatening the future of Africa in terms of uh, this, this pandemic. And Professor is going to talk about what is happening and uh, the preparedness that are there, the vaccines and whether they are effective against these uh, new mutations that have been detected. For example, in Kenya, a few weeks ago, uh, the, 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 virus, the variant that was found in India and the one that uh, was found uh, much earlier in the U UK have somehow combined into one. And we want to understand what is happening and uh, how, how deadly are some of these viruses and what should Africa do, or Kenya, for example, Uganda and others, to be able to be ready for the eventualities of the con or the consequences of the vaccines. So, Professor, you're most welcome. Please uh, address the journalists that are ready to listen to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity again uh, to be able to discuss this very important uh, topic. Uh, so my discussion today will be on COVID-19 vaccines and the virus mutation that has been introduced. This is an area of concern. Um, my outline of presentation, it will be good to give a little background of COVID-19 so that when we're talking about COVID-19 vaccines, and finally, talking about the virus uh, vari variants, uh, we are on the same page. So just COVID-19 disease, I always like reminding people, it is caused by this uh, virus, which is called a coronavirus, a very beautiful looking virus with spikes in it. And uh, this is not the first coronavirus that uh, we are facing. It is a zoonotic infection, which means it uh, comes from animals to human beings. And it is the third outbreak that we are having. Uh, the first one having been in 2002, uh, caused by SARS-CoV, and then 2012, caused by MERS-CoV. And then finally, what we are in at the moment, which has already caused more than 3.2 million deaths from uh, SARS-CoV-2, and that is responsible for the coronavirus. When we say it comes from animals, this is the animals that uh, introduced SARS-CoV uh, in 2002, the palm civet. And then this is the animals, the camels, that produ um, produced a mask of in the Middle East in 2012. And finally, the pangolin that is associated with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 responsible of COVID-19. So how do we look at vaccines, uh, COVID-19 vaccines? Always like to distinguish between vaccines and medicine. This is very important because I see many people confusing the two that a vaccine is a substance that uh, is given to somebody who is not infected, and then it stimulates the body of that person to produce antibodies or white blood cells to fight the germ that causes the disease. In this case, uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus, SARS-CoV-2. It can be a vaccine developed against bacteria, parasites, and other germs. And that is in distinction to drugs, uh, which is the substance that is given to the body and it is that substance that fights the disease causing germ. And it fights the virus, the bacteria, or the parasite. And in our case, we are talking about uh, COVID-19 causing germ SARS-CoV-2. At the moment, we really don't have a very good drug that is able to do that. What is a vaccine, therefore, to distinguish the two? Uh, drugs are largely for treating people who are already infected. Uh, one drug can be used for several diseases. Uh, so you have an antibiotic that, for example, can uh, treat typhoid, but at the same time, it can treat a urinary tract infection, it can treat a throat infection, and so on. But vaccines are largely given to prevent people from becoming infected, and they are very specific. When you develop a vaccine against COVID-19, that vaccine will only protect you against COVID-19, unlike the drugs that can be used to treat other conditions as well. And this is important for us to distinguish. 
And uh, just a quick look at how the vaccines we currently have against COVID-19 have been made. They have uh, different ways of doing it. So you can use the, the, the picture in the middle is the virus with all this projection on the surface that is called uh, spike proteins. You can make that virus, weaken it, so it is still alive, but it is weakened. That is what we call attenuation. And therefore, it cannot cause disease in a human being. But when somebody is given the vaccine, the, it stimulates, the body stimulates responses, thinking that it has become infected. And those antibodies and cells are therefore ready in the event that now you face the real virus, that you are protected. Uh, or you can take just the portion, what you're calling the spike protein, and develop a vaccine out of it. The, the portion that you are taking is what is described as the fingerprint of the virus. So when the body sees that plasmid, it's a surface, it thinks it has seen the virus and therefore produces responses to fight it, either as antibodies or as cells, white blood cells. But the third way of making a vaccine, and this is a, what is being used largely in Africa, is by what we call a vectored vaccine, where you take that plasmid, the fingerprint of the virus, and you put it in another vector, which is a weakened uh, virus that does not cause infection in human being, but that makes the body recognize that plasmid much faster and in a much more robust way. Therefore, the immune responses are generated in larger quantities and much faster than if you use a plasmid. The final one, which we still don't have in Africa, very few countries are using it, is a new technology called the messenger RNA technology. And this is uh, where there are some vaccines like uh, Moderna and uh, Pfizer vaccines where you take the message that the virus uses to prepare this uh, spike protein, and then that is what you inject into a human cell. The human cell reads that message, protect, prepares this uh, spike protein on its surface, and then the same human being's immune response recognizes that protein and therefore produces antibodies and white blood cells to fight uh, the COVID uh, virus. So the body is therefore protected that way. Now, where do these vaccines work? Vaccines can work in different places. Um, so for specifically for COVID-19, we are going to dwell at uh, where it prevents people from getting severe disease. So vaccines typically protect people from becoming infected. That is where the first X, where when your body gets exposed to the virus, you do not become infected. Now, it's important to know that not all vaccines work that way. The, the next place where the vaccines can work is that you still become, you might become infected, but the progression from severe or non-symptomatic disease to severe disease is what is contained. So therefore you might become infected, you have no symptoms at all, or you only have mild symptoms. And this is key for COVID-19 because the problem we have with COVID-19 is progressing to severe disease. So if you are prevented from uh, progressing to severe disease, you will not require hospitalization, you will not require intensive care unit, ICU, you will not require uh, ventilation where you're requiring oxygen, you are not going to require mechanical ventilation, and therefore it will also prevent you from dying. Now that is the focus of all the vaccines that are currently in use. That uh, prevention of progression from uh, infection to severe disease, the vaccines are similar. Now the other place where we are hoping that the vaccine will also work is preventing transmission to other people. And this is what will help us to open up our spaces and go back to normal. Now, in terms of the COVID-19 vaccination update, uh, to date, uh, by yesterday, 2.1 billion doses of uh, COVID vaccines had been given globally. Now, there are about uh, nine vaccines that are currently being used, but about four are the front runners. There are some vaccines that are still uh, just largely regionally used, and this is in, uh, in Russia and, uh, and China. But the most common ones that are being used globally are about six vaccines. The Pfizer vaccine, Moderna vaccine, AstraZeneca vaccine, 
uh, Johnson and uh, Johnson vaccine. Those are the ones that are mainly in the front run. About 250 countries are currently vaccinating people uh, against COVID. Uh, six countries have not started vaccination. Unfortunately, four of these six countries are in Africa. So we have North Korea, there is no data on vaccination, Haiti, uh, Tanzania, uh, Chad, Burundi, and Eritrea. Now, the most commonly administered vaccine to date is the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. It is the one that has been given to the majority of people. Now, the problem we have with uh, uh, the COVID vaccines, as you are going to see, is the unfair distribution of these vaccines. So you, you find that there are countries that have so much stockpile of these vaccines, much more than the population that require it in those countries. And then there are some countries that have very, very little of these vaccines. And this is what brings a bit of inequity. So the US, for example, has vaccines they have stored that can be used to three times their population, their adult population. Uh, Canada has stockpiles of uh, four times its population, either currently available or already placed in order by pharmaceutical companies. And the UK has about three times its general population. So if you look at the world at the moment, uh, this is a figure up to 2nd of June, just two days ago, about 15% of the population has been vaccinated, has received either one, uh, one dose or two doses of the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. But that picture is misleading. If you then divide it per region, per continent, you find that North America has about 37% of its population vaccinated, Europe about 32%, uh, South America just below 20, Australia about 16%, Asia about 7%. And unfortunately for Africa, it's less than 2% of the population has been vaccinated. And these are people who have received either one or both vaccinations if it requires two doses. Now, if you go country by country, um, you'll find that Seychelles is actually one of the leading ones. It has had about 70% of its population having received one or uh, both uh, doses in situations where you require both doses. Seychelles has also uh, used multiple vaccines. They have used the AstraZeneca vaccine, they have used Sputnik vaccine, and they have used one from China called the Sinovaccine. Then you feel that is the only country in Africa that is up there. Uh, the next country that is doing fairly well is Morocco, with about 5% of its population having been vaccinated. And uh, if you now look at the next country that are doing uh, well by African standards, we are very low. So we find Rwanda, uh, then Kenya, and South Africa. But the numbers are very, very low. So what about if you're looking at the countries that have vaccinated more than um, that we have had administered uh, vaccine administered for 100 people. If you look at this picture, the darker the country, the more vaccines have been given. So if you find that you find that the US, for example, is fairly dark, uh, you find other parts of um, Europe and so on. But if you look at Africa, it's very pale is to tell you that the number of people who deserve to be vaccinated is very, very low. What about the people who are now fully vaccinated? And this is important because a single vaccination might protect some people, but it will be very, very few people who are protected. And this is the situation in Narcissus, for example. You've heard of uh, people who have become infected and you have the, the, the numbers were rising. But it's because of, although a number of people have been vaccinated, uh, majority of those have only got a single vaccine. Um, studies seem to suggest that for you to get fully protected with the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, it only kicks in uh, two weeks after getting your final vaccination if it's a two-dose vaccine. Now, as a result of this disparity, so this is this is a picture in France, uh, where people in Germany, where people are uh, getting their vaccination, and the vaccines are easily available. So you just have to queue for the vaccine, and, and you get it. 
Now, what are the effects of being fully vaccinated? One is that life will come back to normal. And we're seeing this in these countries. So social gatherings, um, like the restaurants now are being opened up, places of worship are being opened up, restrictions are being lifted. Um, there are places where by now they're talking about masks not being mandatory. Uh, people are being talking about uh, hugging and kissing in the US, in the UK. Uh, Germany, there are no curfews for people who have been fully vaccinated. They can go to zoos and uh, they can go to hair salons, they can go to meetings as long as they're meeting with people who are fully vaccinated. Travel bans are being lifted. Uh, France has this thing called passe sanitaire, where if you're fully vaccinated, now you can leave the country, you can travel anywhere else, and when you come back, you're not expected to have a COVID test uh, conducted on you. So you can see the benefits of being fully vaccinated. And so the, it's a shame that uh, very few countries in Africa will have people who are fully vaccinated. In the UK, the restaurants and bars are opening up, hotels are opening up, cinema halls, theaters, museums can fully open. And uh, meetings um, which had been restricted previously within houses with people from outside has now also been opened up as a result of full vaccination. And so this is just a picture in the UK. You cannot believe that this is post COVID. The picture is very, very similar to the times that we used to have uh, before COVID set in, in, in December, 2019. And the whole world is looking and hoping that this will be a reality uh, in different parts of the world. Unfortunately, there are many countries uh, that are lagging behind with the vaccination. Now, how about COVID-19 vaccines and the virus uh, variants? Now, it's important for us to remember that all viruses evolve over time. The problem with viruses is that they keep on making mistakes as they replicate. And this is not unique to the virus that causes COVID-19. Viruses uh, make copies of themselves. Unlike animals which reproduce and lay produce young ones, viruses make copies of themselves. The problem is that in the process of making the copies, sometimes they make a mistake. And this is what is resulting in what we call mutations. If you make a mistake so that the copy is not exactly like the original, we say that the virus has had a mutation. Now, when you have several of these mutations, one or two mutations, we say that now you have a new variant. It, you are varying from the original, and that is why they are called variants. Now, per se, Virants are not necessarily a bad thing. It's not always that a virant is a bad thing because a virus can mutate, become even less infectious. The copy that it has might be less infectious. The fear is that when that copy, the mutation, the virant that has been created is highly infectious. The virus can also make a mistake and the copy that it makes, the new variant, can be less easily spread, okay, and less cause uh, severe disease. So that happens. We should never forget that. Our concern is that should the make mistake be made, the variant becomes much more effect, uh, effective in being transmitted and also causes much more severe disease than the original virus. Now, most viral mutations so have little or no impact at all. In the, in, the, in the ability to cause infection or in the ability to cause severe disease. But depending on where that mutation occurs in the genetic material of the virus, it may have certain effects. So one is transmission. It can be much more or less easily transmitted. Number two is in terms of severe disease. Uh, a, mutata, a, muta, a mutant, a new virus will be either much causing much more severe disease. It might cause the same amount of disease or severity, or our fear is that it might cause uh, more disease. Now, the other concern we say is that if you have this genetic uh, change, a, a virus can escape what we call diagnostic escape, so that making diagnosis becomes difficult. Um, and a virus, finally, with regard to vaccine, the change, the mutation, can result in the vaccines that are currently in use not being able to work against the new mutants. Now, with regard to COVID-19 specifically, 
there have been multiple variants globally, and there are many, many, many variants. And, and in, a, in a place like the UK, they have uh, you know, Boston virus, they have New York virus, they have California uh, variant, and so on and so forth. But the ones we call variants of interest are basically four. And why do we call them variants of, of interest? Because we think that there is a likelihood, although not always, not been confirmed yet, of either being more easily transmitted or causing more severe disease. So we have the UK variant, uh, B117. Uh, we have the South African variant, uh, B1351. We have the Brazilian variant, P1, and we have the Indian variant. And these are our concerns. We are going to emphasize this. Are they more easily transmitted? Are they causing more severe disease? Are we likely to miss diagnosis? And what about the response to, to current uh, vaccines? Now, coming specifically to Kenya, we have the COVID-19 variants in Kenya, which are of concern. We have identified three in Kenya. So the majority of these uh, variants that uh, we have identified in Kenya are South African and followed by the UK variant, and then more recently, the Indian variant. And Kisumu, which is in Western part of the country, is the epicenter for the Indian variant in Kenya. Now, the implications are still not very clear with regard to transmission, to disease, to diagnosis, or to vaccine escape. But one thing that we need to emphasize uh, for, for the general population is that the control measures we use against different variants are the same, same, same measures that we use against the usual virus. So nothing will change with regard to uh, control measures. Now, what is the impact of the virus on COVID-19 vaccines? Now, vaccines are likely to protect against virus to some extent, and there's a reason for this. So although we are getting all these virus emerging, we have some level of confidence that the current vaccines that were developed, even before this virus emerged, will have some protection against the virus to some extent. And why do we say that? Because the, by nature, the way these vaccines have been designed, they have been designed to produce what we call broad immune responses, uh, which covers a wide range of antibodies and uh, white blood cells, we call T cells, that would have a very good likelihood that it would uh, attack a, a virant uh, virus. Thus, mutation should not make vaccines completely ineffective. Uh, it might make some vaccines less effective, but it is unlikely that the mutants will make a, a vaccine completely ineffective. Now, in the event that you find a vaccine uh, is less effective against a virant, uh, the composition of that vaccine needs to be changed. And the scientists are working day and night, matching and testing the new variants against the existing vaccines. Now, are vaccines effective against virants? The only way of knowing is by testing. And data is continuously being collected and being analyzed to see whether the vaccines we are currently using are effective against the virus. And there are two ways. How, how do you test this? There are two ways of testing uh, whether the vaccines are effective against the virus. There are two ways. One is called in vitro, which you test in the lab, and the other one is called in vivo, which means in life. How do you do an in vitro testing? So what you do, you, you people who have been vaccinated with these current vaccines, you collect blood from them because as we said, they will have generated some antibodies and white blood cells that are fighting the virus. And then you incubate, you take the virus, the new mutant, and then you, you, you put it in a, in, in, in a lab. We do what you call incubation. That is you mix them together. And then you observe whether the vaccine uh, the, the, uh, the responses that have been generated by the vaccines are able to neutralize that virus. So this is a lab situation. It is called in vitro uh, situation. So you'll be able to tell oh, that this vaccine produced responses that are able to neutralize this mutant virus. But we also have what you call in vivo. And, and uh, in vitro testing is much faster and that is what this, all these drug manufacturers and vaccine manufacturers are doing all the time. If you get a new variant, you test it. 
uh, against uh, uh, serum or blood from people who have already been vaccinated. But we have what we call an in vivo, where you do clinical trials and you compare the new infections. So you recruit people who have not been in, uh, who have not been infected. They are given the vaccines, and in the event that any of them develops uh, signs and symptoms of COVID. Uh, you diagnose COVID in them, and then you compare of the infections that you are getting, which ones are from the original virus and which ones are from mutant virus. And you'll be able then to compare. For, so for example, for simplicity, you find that people who have been vaccinated, 10 people have become COVID infected. And you find that of those 10 COVID infections, nine of them are of the new mutants, and only one is from the old virus. So you say, oh, then, the, the likelihood that this vaccine is protecting people from the original virus, but not from the virus, the new mutants is very high. So, but how, the question that we ask ourselves is how do we prevent new virus? Now, the, the amount of new virus that will emerge will depend on the rates of transmission. If you have a place where transmission is occurring very rapidly, then you have chances of getting uh, mutants or virants that then result into mutants, mutation that results in virants will be very high. And it is no wonder where you are having now mutations in the Indian scenario because the transmission is rap up occurring very rapidly. So if you want to prevent development of new virants, you have to slow down transmission. Uh, one of the ways that we need to do that is by scaling up the vaccine rollout. If you do vaccine rollout faster and more widely, uh, more people will be protected. They will not be exposed to the original virus, which can then mutate in them. And so therefore you reduce the risk of getting new virus. And for this uh, purpose, we need to have a more equitable access to vaccines. And this is very important. I find it rather uh, curious that there are some countries that are only concentrating on their population and leaving the transmission to continue in other parts of the world. And that will result in more violence happening. So this is a situation where the global community needs to come together and understand that controlling a COVID only in their country and leaving it to continue to be transmitted in other parts of the world is a disadvantage to them as well, because you'll get mutations uh, and uh, the likelihood that then you'll get virus that the vaccines that are currently in place will not be that uh, effective. So we need more people vaccinated. We need less virus in circulation, and that will result in less uh, uh, mutations and less virus. So how do you prevent that? It's the typical old story of social distancing, staying at home if you're unwell maintaining social distance, avoiding shaking of hands, using disposable tissue ones and throwing them, uh, sneezing into the elbow, not touching mouth, fingers on nose, mouth and the face and uh, washing uh, hands uh, repeatedly or using sanitizer. There is nothing that is in addition, uh, that is required in addition to prevent the development of uh, virus. And these are pictures that I keep on referring to. This is a pol political meeting in Africa, in Kenya, where people do not follow this COVID-19 protection. And that is another one where people do not wear masks, people do not keep social distancing. And with this, you are likely to get a fourth wave in Kenya because we have gone, we have gone through our third wave now. Nothing magical, nothing, uh, it's not rocket science. If you do not observe COVID-19 prevention protocol, transmission will continue, waves will keep on coming now and then, mutants and virus will be a story uh, because of the continued uh, transmission. Uh, this is a picture I like where people at this Kenyans are discussing Tanzanian and they're saying, you know, we, have, we seem to be very good Tanzanian, they're not wearing the mask, but there is no difference between us and them. But then why vaccinate even with new virus? Now, uh, even with the virus, the world has to keep on vaccinating and keep on monitoring whether the vaccines are working against the new virus or not. 
Vaccines are a critical tool in the battle against COVID-19. Without vaccines, we will never re re return to normal. Without vaccines, we'll not open our businesses, we'll not open travel, we'll not open the entertainment industry, we'll not open the hospitality industry, schools will continue to be closed on an ad hoc basis. So we need our vaccines. Vaccines are life-saving and they prevent severe disease. We must not put off getting vaccinated just because of our concerns about new virus. So we keep, must keep on uh, proceeding with vaccination, even as we try to see whether the vaccines are going to be as effective uh, to the, against the new virus as they are to the, to the old virus. Uh, we must keep in our hand, but continue to improve that. So in summary, what, what we've discussed then, we have looked at COVID-19 just to refresh our minds what it, this disease is. We've looked at the vaccines that are currently in use and uh, distinguished between them and treatment. And we have then also looked at uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine vis-a-vis uh, -vis the current uh, virus mutations that are circulating. And we have uh, ended by saying we have to continue vaccination Viral mutation or no viral mutation. Thank you very, very much. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Jaoko. Um, colleagues, you've had, uh, let's have the questions uh, that you have to Professor as, uh, and, and he will be ready to respond to them. Who wants to go first? Hi. Yes, Jael. Jael is from Uganda. Just introduce yourself and uh, ask your question. Um, I actually have three questions. Um, yes. I'm called Jael from Uganda, Metro Radio. The first question is, we in Uganda, we, we got a second wave, but it looks like the, the younger age, Sorry, Jael, we lost you. The, the baby, because we neglected them in the first phase or what was the problem? Then the other question is, we have gotten people, I'm sorry, my network was bad. I don't know if he mentioned, but we have gotten people who got two doses and have died from the, from the virus. Mm. What would have gone wrong? Is it the vaccine or is it that their bodies did not adapt to them, to, to, to the vaccination they got? Then the countries, the six countries in Africa you talked about, is, are they taking any kind of measures to cap down any Any, 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 I hope I was clear. Uh, just repeat the last question, Jael. He talked of the, the six countries that, that have not enrolled on the vaccination program. Has he heard of any measures being taken by these countries and and how big are they affected as a country are they also losing people like in the other countries let's say the americans who are and, and india where people are dying at a very high rate okay thank you prof you want to respond to those before yes yes I will, I will okay thank you so the the the, the second wave in uh, uganda as you you say uh, that was affecting young people it, it is, um, let's remember that these waves have nothing to, they don't change. It just depends on, on the exposure to which uh, people are making themselves. So if young people expose themselves to, to exposure, the wave will be higher amongst uh, the young people. So if, um, you know, the elderly people are doing it, it will be, so it is not dependent. The wave is just a new, a set of infections that occur as a result of exposure. So that is what I would say. Uh, one of the things that 
probably if you're seeing it in young people, I don't know the story of Uganda. I don't know if this occurred during the schools uh, reopening and all that, because in Kenya, we, when we had the third wave, we had a lot of infections which were coming from children, uh, bringing the infection from, from school to, to their parents. I know at least five situations where that happened. Now, the, typically, the thing about children is that their immunity is usually very, very good. And uh, so they will fight it off like, um, like just a common cold. So in these cases, the five I'm telling you, children come from school, they have a cough, a running nose, and uh, they are treated um, uh, just like a running nose and they recover. And then a few days later, the parents start having cough and fever and they're not responding. And that is when it is suspected that they have COVID and you do a test and you find parents uh, have test COVID. And in some situations, some parents had to go to ICU uh, because now there are difficulties in breathing and so on. And when you test the children who had um, just recovered, they test COVID positive, but they, they, they just fought it off. So it's hard to say exactly what happens in Uganda. You know, these things vary from, from one, one experience to the other. Uh, the other question you talk about is um, the one of uh, these countries that are not vaccinating. Uh, do I know anything about them? Unfortunately, I don't. This is just on record. We know because at the moment, the vaccines are so centralized. We know which countries are getting what vaccines. We know which countries are using what vaccine. And these are countries that have not received any vaccine. So maybe their residents, uh, maybe their citizens have traveled outside and gotten we can't tell. Uh, as to the control measures that they are taking to prevent COVID, again, that is valid. That is a national uh, strategy that I am not aware of. And if they do not display it or share it, there is no way I can be able to tell that. There was a second question that I've forgotten. Could you, uh, Daniel, maybe you can remind me? There were three questions I've addressed to. What was the second? About whether that the, the cases of somebody who died after oh, the one who died. Okay. Now that is a hard yes. question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That is, I've not heard of um, any of that. So that's a hard question. What we know, for example, in the case of seashells, um, is it's their theories as to what could have happened. One in a country that is using multiple vaccines, um, uh, some that were, you know, have emergency use, use authorization and others that do not have. It is a mixed bag. You really can't tell which vaccines has what and so on. Uh, in the case of Uganda, my understanding is, is that you're using the AstraZeneca vaccine only. I don't know if you're using any other one. It will be interesting to observe how soon after getting the second vaccination did they die? how soon after getting the vaccination, did they even acquire COVID? Because there are people who by the time they're getting the vaccine, they already have COVID, okay? And, and we have seen it here in Kenya. We have seen, um, and the prominent ones are the politicians who come out publicly to say that. So you find that somebody is vaccinated today and three days later, they have symptoms of COVID is to tell you that they had COVID even before they were vaccinated. And if such a person then dies, you don't say that the vaccine is not working. They had COVID before they got the vaccine. Then there are people who, when they're getting the first dose, do not have COVID. But remember the first dose is not fully protective and you acquire COVID in between the first dose and the second dose and you are not as protected. So if you die, even after getting your second dose because the immune system had not kicked out, uh, kicked off, then we cannot say that the vaccine is not working. The way we can tell that the vaccine did not protect such a person is a person who got two doses, two weeks later, they were still not symptomatic. Then they acquire infection two weeks after getting their final dose, and then they succumb to COVID. That is the only, so it's a mixed bag and nobody can tell you what happened in what unless you, you have more details. Good morning, Prof. Uh, this is Kevin Owino from KBC English Service. I must have met you before. 
Uh, morning, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a question on the in vitro test. I want to believe that in vitro vaccines, uh, that th this, I believe, are vaccines that have been tested in the lab. And uh, I also want to believe that most African countries are using this, the ones that the product, the vaccines that are the products of in vitro test, not in vivo. Um, now that really the um, efficacy of not really so far because most uh, of our population have not received their second doses. Uh, what would be the effect of uh, maybe using, um, taking the first dose AstraZeneca, for example, because they have been tested in the lab, all of them, they are not, uh, they have not been um, products of clinical tests. And then uh, the second uh, dose you take uh, Johnson and Johnson, for example, would that have any effect on the life of somebody? Thank, 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 thank you. Okay, thank you, Kevin. I, I just need to clarify, uh, all the vaccines that are currently in use have gone through clinical trials. So when we are talking about in vivo and in vitro testing, we are talking about testing to see whether the virants that are currently emerging will be uh, controlled by the vaccine that was tested in clinical trials. So none of the vaccines has only been tested in in vitro studies. All of them, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, Sinovac, Sputnik, all of them, Johnson & Johnson, have gone through clinical trials. And the way you do clinical trials, I didn't go into the details of that, is uh, to first test them in animals so for safety, so you know that the vaccines are safe in animals. And you also test them in animals for immunogenicity, which means that they're producing the desired uh, immune response, which is uh, antibodies and white blood cells. And that is when you now test them in human beings. And in human beings, we test them in three phases. We test the first phase, we focus on safety. And you want to see whether the side effects that were seen in animals, which were mild, are also replicated in human beings. Remember, when you do animal studies and the vaccines are so toxic, causing serious uh, side effects in animals, they don't cross over to human beings. We stop it there. So it's only the ones that are safe in animals that you test in human beings. And phase one, you test for safety. Phase two, then you focus on the immune responses. So you give people the vaccine and then you collect their blood and you see whether they have the white blood cells that you want them to produce or the antibodies that you want them to produce. Then you have to go to phase three where you test it in thousands of people. And all these vaccines have been tested in excess of 35,000 people where you then show that the vaccine is actually protecting people from getting severe disease. That's it. And it is in this phase that all these vaccines during the clinical trial, none of the people who are given the vaccines and finished two doses ever developed severe disease that led to death. So all of them remained with mild disease and did not progress to death. Compared to people who did not get the vaccines who are in the same studies, who are receiving something called a placebo, which is something that does not have any chemical content in it. And when they compare the people who received the vaccine versus people who received the placebo, none of the people who received the vaccine succumbed to death. None of the people developed severe disease requiring hospitalization and ICU treatment. So we know that the vaccines work. So all of them had uh, clinical trials. Now, the in vitro, in vivo then comes like this. So a new variant has come. When the vaccine was being tested, it was not there. The question scientists and the general population would want to know, the, because this variant was not there when this vaccine was being tested in clinical trials, is it still being affected by the vaccine? Now, the only way we can do that are two ways. One, these people who have already been vaccinated and have already received two doses of the vaccine, we can collect their blood because we know their blood has antibodies and it has these white blood cells. Then in the lab, we collect this mutant virus, put them in a, what we, 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 we say incubate, we put them together, we mix them. And if the virus is sensitive to the antibodies and cells that are produced by these people who are fully vaccinated, the virus will die. So we say that the virus has been neutralized. 
And that is what is happening now. And many of these vaccines they have been able to show in vitro that the vaccines are working. But the other way you can now be able to do is in real life situation, what we call in vivo testing, where you can do a clinical trial again. And now some other drug companies are doing that. So you, you enroll people into a clinical trial, you give them the vaccine. In the event that some people become infected, you then compare uh, the new infections are they from the old virus or they're from the new mutations that are occurring? Then if the numbers are so significantly different, we can then be able to say that uh, the vaccines are effective against the old virus, but not effective against the mutants. Dr. thank you. Uh, I, I needed uh, also a clarification on um, uptake of the, uh, of the vaccine. If you have taken uh, uh, Astra, AstraZeneca, for example, Yes. Would, you, would you take Johnson & Johnson for the second dose, or if it's AstraZeneca, you go by that? If it's Johnson & Johnson, you go by that? And what are, what are the effects? Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I forgot, I forgot to answer that. So for medicine, we only make recommendations based on studies that have been done. Now, when these vaccines were being developed, nobody thought about mixing eh? We knew each company was developing its own vaccine. And so each company had schedules of how their vaccine should be given. Either as a single dose for Johnson & Johnson and the others, all of the others have uh, had uh, uh, two doses where you have what you call a prime. It, it prepares your body. That is why it's called a prime. And then it is boosted by a second uh, vaccine. So it's called a boost. Uh, and it's only after getting a prime with a boost that your body has enough antibodies and cells to fight the COVID virus in the event that it comes across it. Now, because of the shortage of vaccines, now people have started asking the question you're asking, can I prime with, uh, uh, with AstraZeneca and boost with Johnson & Johnson? Now, the only way we can answer that question is by doing research. There is no way anybody can tell you without doing and showing in a clinical trial that it works. Now, some companies have already started that. There is a currently a study going on where in, uh, in the UK where they're giving John's, um, AstraZeneca vaccine as a prime and boosting with this, the, the Russian one called Sputnik. There are some studies where they are giving uh, AstraZeneca with, um, with uh, Pfizer vaccine. Now, the, the data that I've seen at the moment, you see, when you do that, you have to be careful uh, that you're also not making it uh, unsafe. So the first phase of such a trial is to measure safety. Is it as safe to give AstraZeneca and then followed by Sputnik? Is it as safe to give AstraZeneca followed by uh, Janssen? Uh, compared to getting two doses of AstraZeneca or to getting a single dose of uh, Janssen or to getting two doses of, of, uh, of, um, of the other vaccine, the way they are designed. So when we do that, we're talking about using homologous and heterogous, and you don't need to know to those term terminology. Homologous is where you're using the same vaccine for priming and boosting. Heterologous is where you're, you are mixing the vaccine. And the preliminary results have shown that mixing AstraZeneca with Pfizer vaccine, the side effects are more, but fortunately, the side effects are mild. It's just the numbers of people who develop the side effects are more compared to when you're not mixing. But in terms of severity of the side effects, they are still mild, meaning that there is no risk of mixing. Now, the next phase that they are looking at at the moment is whether the immune responses that are generated when you mix are similar to when you do not mix, or they are better, or they are worse. So the only way we can ever be able to tell people to mix is after we get the results of the studies that are ongoing. Thank you, Prof, for that. I saw Gabriel's uh, hand was up. Uh, Gabriel, do you have a, you can now ask your question, if you can hear me. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to know from from Prof, if it's possible for us to know the ingredients used in manufacturing these vaccines, and also if there's any way these vaccines are interrelated, like uh, they can attach 
they can be they can attach to each other like a common flu is caused by a virus then you also find covid is a virus is there any way covid can attach its the covid works uh, i mean covid virus can attach itself to this other common flu then uganda was trying to come up to say that africa can manufacture her own vaccine i just wanted to know if that can that can and is possible thank you yeah so yes um so the, the the thing about the vaccines working against another another one um, that is not that is not possible. Remember that these viruses are different. Eh? Uh, the germ that causes the disease. You design a vaccine based on the germ that is causing a disease. So for COVID nineteen, you look at the remember uh, in my presentation I talked about the gen the, the fingerprint. So just to make it simple, uh, COVID uh, virus. Uh, the virus causing COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV, has what we call spike protein, and it is the spike protein that you use to prepare a vaccine. Uh, the, the flu viruses does not have a spike protein, so if you prepare a vaccine based on a spike protein, uh, it will not protect you against flu. So just remember that viruses, there are thousands and thousands of different viruses. So you, when you are designing a vaccine, you have to know for which virus are you designing uh, the, the, the vaccines. So they'll not work across uh, virus. If you ever find a vaccine working across viruses, that is by, by accident. It was not, not by default. So all the vaccines you have at the moment, there is no vaccine that works across the other disease. So if you get a vaccine against uh, measles, you'll still get, um, you'll get polio. If you get a vaccine vaccinated against polio, it will not protect you against any other. But both measles and polio are viruses but the vaccines will not protect you across, uh, across uh, the viruses. Um, uh, it tells you my age. I've forgotten the other two and I have nowhere to write. Eh? Just if you mention it, I'll remember. Daniel, assist me. Uh, it was ability about... of Africa to manufacture oh. a virus, uh, a okay. vaccine. Okay, ability to make a yeah. vaccine. And then there was another question as well. There were three. Uh, the ingredients used in ah, the ingredients. The thank you thank you thank you gabriel the ingredients are not it's not a secret it's an open thing whenever you make any product for use in uh, human beings uh, vaccines or drugs it's an open secret you you have to tell people what is in the ingredients of all those vaccines so if you all these vaccines and you, you even if you just google you'll find out if you want to know the ingredient of any vaccine it's all there in the in the media it's 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 a it's not a secret at all. It tells you what, what the antigen is, what, what they use to prepare the antigen. It also tells you the solutions that they use. Uh, there are some things we call uh, adjuvants. So it gives you all the information there. So that is, you can get that anytime. If you need, you can ask me, I can look for them if you can't find them. With regard to vaccine manufacture, it's a good idea, but I always tell people, you see the, the, the confusing thing for many people is that when you see a vaccine, in a vial, it looks like a very easy thing to make, okay? But it has a lot, a lot, a lot that is required for you to develop a vaccine. And manufacturing a vaccine is an infrastructure problem. It is not lack of science, lack of knowledge, it's an infrastructure of problem. And the way I always help people to visualize it is that the way Africa has no aeroplane, we have we buy planes from Boeing in the Americas, or we buy uh, Airbus in Europe. It is the same. Visualize it that way: that when you do not have infrastructural and technical capacity, making a vaccine is just as difficult as doing all making the other technical things. Africa has no mobile phones that they make. Africa has no vehicles that we make. We have to keep on importing. Why? It is an infrastructural problem, and it is a financial problem. Now, the AU uh, attended a meeting where there are discussions of can countries come together to then um, develop vaccine manufacturing plant regional. So like if you have one in South Africa that caters for the South African countries, we have one in East Africa, we have one in North Africa, and we have one in Western Africa, where people bring their resources, their expertise, their technical capacity, their infrastructural networks, 
together and leverage on one another. And that is possible, but it will not happen today. It will take a bit of time. There's a lot to making a vaccine than just the vial. And of course, there is a, there is a very serious push by the African Union through the CDC to be able to gather resources and of course the global community, especially the developed countries are coming together also to put in some that can help Africa to come up with, the, with their own vaccine. But the, one of the key challenges that is facing Africa is the issue of patents, Prof. The issue of patents is the key issue because uh, we do not have, we do not own the intellectual property in the vaccines. So that need, first need also to be to be dealt with before we can be able to reproduce some of these vaccines. You're, you're, you're right. You're right in one sense that uh, given the given the emergency with which we need the COVID-19 vaccines, the easiest way is to get a vaccine that has already been manufactured and the patency has been waived because then that way you're not starting from scratch, you'll be able to develop your vaccines uh, quickly. But the concept of the African Union developing vaccine manufacturing capacity in Africa is not geared only towards COVID-19. It is geared towards all the vaccines. And if we had time, Africa has enough researchers to develop their own immunogens and um, start from scratch so that we will not rely on the patencies of other companies to be able to develop a COVID vaccine. But that will take a long time and we don't have the, the luxury of time. And that is why we are pleading uh, for the, develop, for the uh, patencies to be waived. And as you know, there are some countries that are in support of that like the US, but Germany is strongly opposed to that. So, but you are right, the patency is an issue but it's just because of the emergency and agency that we have. Remember, we don't even make our own childhood vaccinations. We've been vaccin Africa has been vaccinating its children for since independence. But even just to manufacture TB vaccine or polio vaccine, or measles vaccine, we don't. So that is why I'm saying that we need to dig to really reflect more than just saying COVID vaccines. We need to ask ourselves questions like, do we have the infrastructure? Do we have the capacity? Uh, technical uh, resources and all that. And the best way is what has been suggested to have regional centers for vaccine manufacturing rather than country. If we go alone as a country, uh, we will not go far. I don't think Uganda will go far if that is the proposal they're having to just have uh, Uganda do it on their own. They would have to require, that would require a pharmaceutical company coming to invest heavily in Uganda the question they'll ask themselves, will they have returns on the investment? And so they'll very unlikely do that. So we require the African Union to be on the forefront, bring countries together, bring the researchers and scientists together, bring the pharmaceutical industry, because you need to partner. This would require a public-private uh, partnership. Get a company that is already manufacturing other things, if they're, if they're not manufacturing vaccines already, but probably they are manufacturing drugs. So they, it will be much easier to put the equipment and the necessary infrastructure in those companies rather than to start from the scratch. Thank you. Let me just follow up on that before we have another question. From, from where you sit, do you have the confidence level that there is enough human resources to begin with to be able to undertake such an uh, enterprise? in Africa. Oh, yes, 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 we have. We, we, we have the resources. Uh, if you bring uh, the, the resources from Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda together, that would not be the challenge. Thank you, Prof. Any other question? I can see people from uh, Nikechi from Nigeria and uh, many others from different countries. Nikechi, what do you have for us from the West. Hello, everyone. Uh, hey. I'm just listening in. It's quite interesting. The topic is interesting. Um, I really don't have any question, but I'm here taking notes of uh, everything that's been said. Thank you very much. And yet, Prof, you can also look at the chat. There are some questions that you may want to respond to if you have not okay, addressed them. Let, let, let me look. I had no access to the chat, but now I have. Uh, 
uh, let me see. Uh, you mentioned that the virus, this is from Tabitha, you mentioned that the virus makes copies of themselves and can make mistakes in the process. So with these mutations, will each variant require its own vaccine? No, I think uh, Tabitha, I said that not all mutations are, are harmful, that actually sometimes the virus makes mistakes, which is to its own disadvantage, it becomes less. And that is why you've heard of some uh, diseases just dying on their own because the virus keeps on making little mistakes that prevents it from being trans, uh, transmitted from one person to the other. So it, not, not every mutation requires a vaccine uh, to be changed. And I say that the only way you can know whether a, muta a new mutant is not being um, attacked by the vaccine is to keep on monitoring. And that is what is happening at the moment. Uh, I and other, this is, this is BSI and other journalists, thousands of Kenyans have gotten only first vaccination. Should I be worried now that the second jab is still unavailable? Yes, um, at the moment, there is no evidence that you get protected by getting a single jab. You require a second jab and you require it after, um, you only get protection two weeks after you getting the second jab. Now, the, the manufacturer of the vaccine that you're referring to, AstraZeneca, recommend that you get two jabs at an interval of uh, four weeks. But the UK government, during the height of their pandemic, they decided that rather than have a few people fully vaccinated at that four week interval, they delayed the second dose so that they can get as many people as possible to get the first dose and then come back and mop up with the second dose. As a result of that, there's some people who got the second dose eight weeks later and the others who got it 12 weeks later. Now, the interesting result was that the people who got it eight weeks later uh, had better response than the ones who got it four weeks as recommended. And the ones who got it 12 weeks later had even better response than the eight weeks. So we know that an interval of 12 weeks is good and even better than the recommended four weeks. The problem we have is that the UK then finalized that they, they did not have people who were delayed more than the 12 weeks. So we have a problem. If we delay more than 12 weeks, we are the ones who will be then, then generating this data and we don't know what the data will show, whether it will be equivalent to the 12 weeks, whether it will be better or whether it will be worse. So at the moment, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, nobody can tell you uh, what to do. We just have to wait. Whenever you get that second dose, then we'll be able to answer that question. Is it necessary to test for corona before you receive the vaccine? No, no, no way in the world are you doing that. Because remember the corona, um, the, the corona vaccine, um, the, the corona disease is a very, it's a moving target. Uh, if you are to start testing people, you will then be diverting attention from getting the vaccine. It's not feasible in the first place. Uh, when, when I do a COVID test in you, uh, in many centers, the results are coming out the following day. And, uh, and uh, so we cannot give you, test you, go home, come back the following day. It will just be a logistic nightmare. Even the best resourced countries are not doing that. Uh, what are the chances of getting an active corona infection from the vaccine? You cannot get a, an active corona infection from the vaccine because the vaccine that we are using, we are not using live vaccines. We are using uh, what you call subunit vaccines, like the one I showed you, we're using a plasmid. Uh, or you're using uh, a vectored vaccine, or you're using messenger RNA. So you cannot become infected from the vaccine. How long does it take for the vaccination to give you full immunity? I, I say that uh, after the studies suggest that it is two weeks, minimum of two weeks after getting the second dose of the vaccine that you'll be able to get protection. Uh, there's a question on herd immunity and vaccine, vaccination induced immunity. Do they provide the same immunity and for how long? Yes, it is the same immunity. The, the issue, the, herd, herd, the difference between what you call herd immunity and your own immunity is that herd immunity is based on the number of people who have been vaccinated around you. So you yourself have not been vaccinated, but because so many people have been vaccinated around you, and they are not becoming infected as a result of the vaccination, then you have no chance of becoming infected because you're interacting with people who have protection already. That is what is called herd immunity. 
Now, as for how long the immunity lasts, whether it is vaccine-induced immunity or herd immunity, nobody can tell you. This is why you require what is called longitudinal study. You follow up people to be able to see how long the vaccine protects against. And that is not unique to COVID vaccines. That is what has been done for all the vaccines that we have ever been given. You follow up people, and that is how you tell that the vaccine requires a boost after three years, a vaccine requires a boost after 10 years. And in some situations, like we've recently learned, uh, you do not require a boost at all, uh, like the yellow fever, which we used to think required 10 years. The data generated of a period of time has shown that you do not require it. Uh, once you're given, you get protection for life. And there is no way we'd have known when the vaccine was being developed, if somebody asked you whether that vaccine will give you protection for life, there was no way you'd ever know. You only know when you do what you call longitudinal follow-up. Um, what are the long-term side effects of the vaccine? It's the same thing. Nobody can tell you, Neither, no vaccine, no medicine, can you be able to talk about the long-term effect of vaccine? So there is something called pharmacovigilance. So once a vaccine has been registered for use or medicine has been registered for use and now it's being given to the general population, you keep on any new data you get, anything that happens to that person, and uh, you think it's linked to the vaccine, you keep on monitoring and that is how you generate a long-term effect. Nobody can be able to tell you. And it's not just for vaccines or medicine. Nobody can tell you long-term effect of mobile phone. Nobody can tell you long-term effect of uh, microwave, which, we, which you use in our houses. So when we, people are obsessed by long-term effect, you actually cannot answer that. And if I get something 15 years from now, is it the vaccine? Is it the microwave? Is it the mobile phone I'm using? Is it whatever? You, it's a very difficult thing to tease out and there is nobody who can be able to answer that at the moment. Um, with the new mutation, can this mean that uh, you need multiple vaccination? That's a good question. Nobody, people have been thinking in response to this new mutation, in the event that we find that the mutations are actually not being um, targeted by the vaccine. What is the alternative? What are the options uh, to having to design new vaccines? Because designing new vaccine takes a bit of time. So we know that you require to, de to, to design a new vaccine, but that takes a bit of time. Is it possible that you can, for people with the mutants, you can then make three doses give three doses instead of giving two doses, would that be more protective and so on? So that is a possibility. And again, nobody knows so that they might require an addition of vaccination, but nobody really knows. Because in science, you have to, you have to test to see whether that is true. You don't give a recommendation based on just your gut feeling. I uh, might be having a gut feeling that for those mutations, you require three or four doses, but I cannot make that policy and recommend, and I have no data to show that. Uh, the Chinese vaccine is being described by WHO as an emergency vaccine. What is an emergency vaccine and what is the difference with others? Actually, it's not, it's not just the, the, the Chinese vaccine. All the vaccines that we are using at the moment are being given under what you call emergency use authorization. Emergency use authorization is where you allow a vaccine to be used because of the data being very, very convincing even as you continue to generate more data. So when you do a phase three trial, uh, where we talked about showing that the vaccine works, the vaccine protects people uh, from getting severe disease or from infection, then when you present that data to a regulatory body, and each country has its own regulatory body. So the USA is the most famous one, it's called the FDA. That regulatory body has to be convinced. Whether WHO says it should be authorized or not, but FDA does not think it should be authorized, it will not be used in the US. In Kenya, our regulatory board is called the Pharmacy and Poisons Board or PPB. They have to be convinced that the vaccine data that has been generated is sufficient for it to be used even as we continue to generate more data. That is what is called emergency use authorization. And all the vaccines that are being used have received emergency use authorization either within their own countries or in addition to that, WHO has also reviewed the data and given them emergency use authorization data. So you'll find that the Sputnik vaccine that was being used in Russia, the Russian government had given them emergency use authorization. 
There are some countries where it was being used, uh, like in Morocco, in Seychelles, where those regulators for those countries had already given them emergency use authorization, but they had not applied to WHO to give them emergency use authorization. So emergency use authorization then was given much later uh, after the other countries had already given. And it's the same for some of the other Chinese manufactured uh, vaccines. Uh, how safe is the vaccine with sickle cell and asthma? Yes, there it's quite safe. Um, when you're doing clinical trials, you actually include people who have what we call comorbidities because these are the people who will benefit most uh, from these vaccines. So in the clinical trials, you include those people. So we know that these vaccines have been tested in people with other comorbidities like asthma, uh, hypertension, uh, diabetes, HIV, and so on and so forth. So there is no chronic morbidity that at the moment uh, is a, a restriction to use of these vaccines. What is the difference between the first and the second dose in terms of chemicals? There is no difference between the first and the second dose. The composition is exactly the same. It's only that when you give it the first time, the body is seeing it for the first time. So it, it, it does what you call, it primes the body. It prepares the body. So when you give a second of the same vaccine, it boosts that prime that was given by the first vaccine. Is it true that the issue of manufactured vaccines have also been used as a political tool against the less developed countries? Is it a money minting strategy or not? Well, that is politics. I'm not very familiar with this uh, politics thing, um, but uh, I have an appeal for, for Africa and especially this usually tends to come from Africa. When, when the world is working hard to get a vaccine, and I still remember at the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic, I was one of the, uh, the researchers who kept on pushing and urging Africa to participate in these trials of these vaccines to get a COVID vaccine. And if you remember very well, pushed by many politicians in Africa, they were urging their people not to be involved, not to participate in the vaccine trials, not to be involved in vaccine research, COVID vaccine research. Now the same, 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 same politicians come after we have found a vaccine and now saying, oh, Africa is being forgotten. You did not even take part in this thing. When the world was coming together to get a solution, you told your people not to participate. You told your people you are being used as guinea pigs. Now, when the food is ready, you all come there and complain that now you are being neglected. And to me, that is a beef I have with the African politician. In a sense, my problem with the West with regard to vaccine is not so much that their people are getting vaccinated. The, my problem is that they are hoarding vaccines. When you have vaccines that goes around three times your population or four times your population, whereas other countries do not have access to that vaccine, I find that immoral and, and, and unjust. But to vaccinate your people where 80% of your people are getting the vaccines and so on, I have no problem with that. My problem is with hoarding. And especially when the same countries were not available when we were developing and testing this vaccine. So I would urge Africa, even now we are still conducting clinical trials. This is not the end of getting a vaccine. We'll keep on trying to develop better and better vaccines. We'll try to get vaccines that are only given as a single dose. The only way we can do that is by participating in clinical trials, developing vaccines, testing them, let Africa participate in our clinical trials. Sorry, Prof, you're muted. Sorry, I cannot see any other question that I've not responded to unless somebody can see. Oh, there's something about blood clots. Um, comment yes. about AstraZeneca vaccine and the fear of clots. Of course, you are saying regardless of variant mutants, people should get vaccinated if we are to go back to our lives in normal. So how best can we deal with the clots? So the issue of the clots, again, we just need to clarify that there is no product, uh, vaccine or medicine that does not have side effects. So the question we ask ourselves is what is the risk benefit uh, analysis of, uh, of uh, a side effects? And I give an example of the blood clots. Do you know that oral contraceptives used by our women for years to, to control or to space up their children have 
associations with blood clots much more than the COVID-19 vaccine. So what do you do? You, you, you do a risk profile, you decide who is most likely to develop the clots and you give them alternatives so that the, you reduce the risk of the getting blood clots uh, if you're using oral contraceptives. It is the same thing that we are going to do with the AstraZeneca vaccine and Johnson & Johnson vaccine has also been associated with clots, is to profile and ask yourself the question, who is at most risk of uh, getting clots and can we give those ones an alternative? But the people who have no risk of developing clots or have insignificant risk will continue to give them that uh, vaccine. And that is what is happening in Europe and it's happening in North America. Why again? Because those countries have enough data to identify the people at risk of getting the blood clots. In Africa, we have not identified people with blood clots, so we cannot even talk about the risk of getting blood clots in Africa. Um, I think that is the last one. Uh, yes, yes, Prof. I can see some two hands from Nikechi, uh, I think in Nigeria, and uh, Elizabeth in Kampala. So Nikechi first, then Elizabeth. Okay, well done, Prof. So um, your call for Africa to have uh, a regional center for the development of uh, COVID-19 uh, resonates with me. Um, but my question is, how is this going to work? Okay, thank you very much. So I think, you know, my, my, this is my suggestion, um, uh, uh, Kechi. It's my suggestion that some people might have a different uh, perspective on this. My perspective is that the best way to do that is through our regional blocks. So the East African community, uh, ECOWAS, uh, SADAC, and so on. Because what you do, you are then leveraging on the strengths of each other. So you bring your researchers together, your scientists together, you bring your manufacturers together to discuss and implement um, uh, a, a way forward with regard to setting up a vaccine manufacturing plan. And again, remember I said that I think it will be short-sighted for us to just think of a COVID vaccine manufacturing plant. We need to think about vaccine manufacturing plant. We are where we make vaccines against uh, childhood in, in, uh, infections so like polio and measles and uh, whooping cough and others. Uh, and at the same time, um, develop uh, capacity to develop a COVID vaccine. Uh, and not only just a COVID vaccine, this is not the last pandemic we are going to have. In the event that we get another pandemic, those centers will be able to deal uh, with those uh, pandemics by developing vaccines. So the way to, in my opinion, is to go regional. Thank you so much. Now, this is Elizabeth. Now, my question about the sickle cell, I think I wrote it wrongly, but my issue was about the transfusion. As a mother of four kids with sickle cells, I was wondering, because at least each of my kids has been getting a transfusion once or twice a year, I wanted to know, do I need to revaccinate them after these transfusions? No, no, there is no relationship between transfusion and getting a vaccine. Just the way you do not revaccinate them against TB, I'm sure they got BCG, they got measles vaccine, they got polio vaccine. We do not require revaccination just because you've received a blood transfusion. There is no vaccine uh, that requires that. Any other question? Hi. Yes, this one Jaila, is a little down. I don't know if Yes, Jail. I don't know if he talked about rolling out, out uh, vaccination in kids anytime soon because we are seeing they are the most affected ones now in this in this coming wave or in the waves that have affected different countries. Uh, so, so the vaccines that you currently have were not tested in pregnant women and were not tested in children for ethical reason. Uh, at the beginning. Um, 
the 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 the, the thing that was um, um, the, the, the evidence was that the older people are the ones who are getting the infection more than the others, and it was also costing more deaths in them than others. Remember that the places where which were first hit very badly were the countries in the West with a very old population. And a lot of these deaths you've seen in Europe, in, uh, in uh, Italy and Spain, uh, in the US, were especially in the elderly people's homes. So the target of the vaccines was to give to the people who deserved it most. Young people and children were least affected. There are people, there are young children and uh, there are young men and uh, women and children who are getting COVID and dying, but they are insignificant compared to the age group of the elderly people. That was number one. Number two, clinical trials usually, the requirement, you cannot just develop a product and test it in children before it is tested in adults. So it was going to delay if we're going to start testing it in adults and then coming to children. And that is why at the moment, there are trials now testing the vaccines in children they, and they, they are doing it in a staged manner. So they went to, I, if I'm not wrong, they are now vaccines being tested in children 12 years and above. And then they keep on coming down to the very, very young children. So it's coming. It's not a priority because the older people are the ones who have the greatest risk, but you're right. Children also need to participate uh, in trials so that we know whether the vaccines work in them or not. Uh, in my own site here, we are designing a study that we are also going to include children uh, by a drug company, which I cannot disclose at the moment because we are still negotiating, and that will include children. In the US now, they have clinical trials that have included children, as I've said, and uh, they're in the stage where they are analyzing it. And in, I think Pfizer vaccine now, they've shown that it actually works in children, and the US will start vaccinating their children as well. Uh, the same with pregnant women. The pregnant women were not involved in those trials, so we could not say confidently whether the vaccine can be used in uh, pregnant women but now there's enough data for some vaccines that we can use them in pregnant women. Do we have any other? I can see somebody oh, yes. saying here, yeah. Linda. Okay, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, yeah. yeah, for me, I have three questions. One, why is it that uh, those who have received the first vaccine they can still contract the virus. Two, how long does it take for this virus uh, to hatch or to be detected uh, to be detected in someone? And uh, three, is it possible for uh, for a government to start providing maybe test kit for COVID nineteen for individuals to do them for themselves? Thank you. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, I talked about that. Uh, Probably you. Uh, Prof, you're muted again. Sorry, sorry. sorry I talked yes, about sorry. that. I, I talked about that. Probably I was not just clear enough. The, the, the purpose of the COVID-19 vaccines is not to prevent you from becoming infected. We are hoping that it will do that. But the biggest benefit of a COVID-19 vaccine is to prevent you from getting severe disease and from dying from COVID. We are hoping that an added, an added advantage would be to prevent you from becoming infected and also to prevent you from spreading the infection to somebody else. Now, you should, we should always know that vaccines uh, work in, um, in a very broad way. And um, if you're there at the beginning, I showed you the, the spectrum of where a COVID vaccine would work, preventing infection, preventing disease progression, preventing transmission. And I say that all the vaccines that we currently use for COVID-19 are known to work in the middle, preventing you from getting severe disease. What that means is that even if you still get COVID infection after getting the vaccine, that is not a problem. You will get a mild COVID. There are people who will get an infection that has no symptoms at all, and you recover. Because the purpose of these vaccines is to prevent you from getting severe disease that will take you to a hospital be admitted. So you're occupying a bed space that can be used for other patients with other diseases. It will prevent you from being taken to ICU and requiring mechanical ventilation and oxygenation, and it will prevent you from dying. That is the focus of the current vaccines. But now we are generating more data that it is doing beyond that. 
that in some situations now it is protecting people from becoming infected. And that is why, as I said, Europe is opening up, America is opening up because we have some, Israel is opening up because we have some evidence that is actually also protecting people from transmitting the disease. So, so for that, you should, people should not be afraid that, oh, uh, why did I get infected after getting the vaccine? That was not the purpose of the vaccine. The purpose was to prevent you from getting a severe disease. Now, somebody has asked, you know, how, why is it that there's some people getting infected even after getting the, 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 the disease? It is the same thing I'm saying. After the first dose, you only get complete protection or significant protection after getting the second dose and two weeks after that. Because remember, the vaccine is supposed to teach your body to fight the infection when it sees it. And it takes time to train your body. So to, for you to produce the antibodies and uh, the white blood cells that are required to fight infection. So you don't get in, injected today uh, with a vaccine and tomorrow you expect that now you're not going to be, you are not going to get uh, COVID in the event that your body contacts, contacts it. I have seen a question about yellow fever. Somebody asking, does it mean that you do not require yellow fever after 10 years? Yes, you do not require uh, getting yellow fever. Uh, uh, WHO is very, very clear on that, that once you get a single dose of yellow fever, uh, it protects you for life. But now politics come into place. Uh, WHO is not a global policeman. It will not force a country. If a country insists that you must have a yellow fever certificate that is less than 10 years, you just have to get it. So I know India, Pakistan require you to get yellow fever. Uh, that is valid uh, less than 10 years. So for that reason, if you're going to countries that require that to be given, you just have to get it. But the evidence is that you don't need it. Hello, Prof. Cut. Otula first, then, uh, then Robert. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. This has really been very informative. What I was wondering, these are general questions. Like um, in Kenya, we have a, a veterinary vaccine facility. Is there any way the medical community or those who make vaccines for the medical world, has any of you ever seen where you can collaborate in terms of equipment mostly and uh, learning a few things? And uh, we also sometimes do tests in the animals before we reach human beings. If Keviva PA in Kenya is doing vaccines for uh, you know, livestock and a few other things, it, can that be some kind of something for the medics to pick on? Then the second one, which is also general, is there anything we can learn from India? I'm told India had very policies that were almost defiant from uh, the patent issues. They have some things on, uh, if something is needed by the country to save lives, they tend to overlook patent rights. And I don't know, or, and they have succeeded maybe because they focus on the technology. So is there, anything we can learn from them. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Otula. Uh, thank you very much. So yes, for Kevavapi, actually the government is uh, doing that at the moment. The Kenyan government has a task force and this is not just for COVID. Uh, this was, uh, it, is, it came even before COVID. I think it started in um, mid 2019 to discuss these issues of uh, making vaccines and especially the childhood vaccine, vaccines. So there are differences uh, as to how the vaccines would make, uh, especially the equipment might be different uh, depending on the, the, the design. As I said, there are many, many ways of designing a vaccine, but there is a lot that you can learn. And there is a task force that has actually has had people from Kevavapi uh, with Kemri. Uh, I was part of this task force as well. It's called the National uh, Vaccine Production um, uh, a task force that has put up a document together. You are right, there is something that we can learn. It will still require resources and finances and uh, expertise that we, we, but we can, we can learn and work with each other. The Indian story of um, patency, um, it's a political one, and that is why you require a lot of political goodwill from the international community. Uh, the problem that we have is that, uh, you know, you can have sanctions against you and, and all that. So you, re you really require uh, international support. And the way it is going, actually, I think it would be the best, where there is a general consensus by the 
the companies that own these patents uh, with support from their government negotiations and say, okay, if we waive the patents with the government or also re reward us, remember, uh, these companies have also put a lot of resources into developing the vaccine. So it's not as easy as just telling people, now that you've spent uh, billions of uh, shillings to develop a product, just tell us what it is so that we can make it and you, you do not recoup what you have put into the, what you've put into the development of, uh, of the product. And that is why, for example, the US is able to really become forceful on, on this patency issue because the vaccines that were developed in the US was largely US government that gave the companies the money to, 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 to develop the vaccine. So it's, they have more of a bargain. You can, the companies cannot argue that they have spent billions of their dollars into developing the vaccine or not, because they also got a lot of support. So what we require from this Western government is as they push for patents to be waived, also to provide some package for these companies so that it's not a losing situation where you have put so much investment. And, and that would apply to each one of us, even each one of us in this meeting. You cannot put a lot of your money uh, into something and then somebody comes and tells you, just give us that for free. You, you, you will not give in without a fight. So it's the same thing with the drug companies. They really need to be assured that uh, they are not going to go at a loss, even as they waive their patency. But that is a way to go to the Indian way has its risks of being sanctioned and all that. Uh, and so each country has to figure out. Uh, probably also it is a, it's one of those that uh, regional bodies like the African Union uh, can try and support so that when you are hit by the big boys, you're not hit alone, but there is, a, there is strength in unity. We are coming to an end. Uh, please make your question short. I think we just have a minute before we, we, we finish this session of the briefing. Thank you. This is Robert. I'm uh, at Metro FM in Kampala. Uh, here in Uganda, the recent days, the catch up of the COVID 19 has been so, so high. Am I clear? Is Patrick, Patrick, it's mute. All right, Robert, My, go ahead. Uh, I was saying that here in Uganda, the rise of COVID-19 cases has been so high in the past days, and most especially here in our capital city, Kampala. And what is so funny is that most of the people are getting vaccinated. And then there is this saying that uh, after someone being vaccinated with the first dose, that there is a law in the immune system that causes the body to be infected so quickly with this virus. How true is it? Because someone was saying that even that's why, like in, the, in India, where the vaccine is coming from, many people are, in, are vaccinated, but why are they getting it so high is that after getting the first dose of the vaccine, the immune system lowers. How true is it, Mr. Walter? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Robert. I've seen all this in the media. There is no, there is no truth in in it at all. Um, a vaccine would not lower immunity. There is no vaccine in the world for any other disease that uh, lowers immunity. In fact, the vaccine, the way the vaccine works, is the opposite, because the vaccine has something we call an immunogen. An immunogen is something that stimulates your immune response to generate either antibodies or specific white blood cells. It's not just the general white blood cells, they're called cytotoxic T lymphocyte cells that immediately your body sees the immunogen, it produces these antibodies and these cells. So there is no truth in it at all. And I think a lot of it started from the anti-vaxxers who um, have put a lot of propaganda on vaccine uh, against, uh, against COVID-19 vaccine. Now, what I find very unfortunate is that a lot of this propaganda actually comes from the West, and I'm not going to mean towards, they come from the West. But the, the, the recipients and the implementers of this propaganda is largely from uh, developing countries. That is why, as I showed you at the beginning, you find countries 
having 70% of vaccine take up, you know, 70% vaccine, vaccine take, 60%. Whereas in Africa, even where the vaccine is available, people are bought in into this propaganda and including healthcare workers who do not then go for the vaccine. So if, if you look at the numbers, it is a shame that Africa is buying into the propaganda, whereas the West is increasing to get their vaccination. Um, now, with regard to what you're saying, that it has been shown that the people who have been vaccinated and uh, they're getting COVID, I explained that before. When you get a vaccine, you are not protected until you get the full dose and two weeks later. I know Uganda started vaccination after us, so I know for sure that the number of people who have received two vaccinations in Uganda would be less than in Kenya. And uh, so I know, and, and in Kenya, the numbers are so few, so I know in Uganda, they are much fewer. So I would not be surprised if some people have gotten infected after getting vaccination because they only got the first vaccine. we've come to an end one question that was not asked is the ongoing development of anti antiviral medicine how will that work is it an alternative to will it be an alternative to the vaccines or they work together yeah thank you for that that is why every time i give a talk on vaccines i try to distinguish the two that there is their vaccines and their their treatments and they are not incompatible they are doing different things. The vaccine is trying to prevent you from getting severe disease in the event that you get the vaccine before you become infected. Whereas uh, the, the, the drugs we are using after you become infected. Now, it is the same story. The, the, the drug component is a big story. It has its own, it's a, it has its own different challenges. So developing a drug for treating COVID, if you we were to go from scratch, we would be starting afresh. It would take a much, much, much longer process to first of all, try and develop a chemical that we test to see whether this chemical is safe in human beings, in animals first, and then in human beings, and whether it's treating or not treating. So the world uh, did a pragmatic thing. We looked at drugs that are already being used because they have already been tested in animals, they've already been tested in human beings, they're currently being used in human beings. And we asked ourselves the question, can they be repurposed to be used against COVID? And so you, and, and you have to have some uh, scientific thinking for you to, to, to ask yourself the question whether a drug can be repurposed. So the first ones were a drug like that was developed for treating uh, Ebola. We know Ebola is a virus disease, a viral disease and so on. And so we asked ourselves the question, this drug has been shown to treat Ebola. Can we see if it is also effective in treating COVID? Or you find a drug that has been used for treating malaria. And you remember the story of hydroxychloroquine and uh, chloroquine and ask ourselves, can we use it to treat a COVID. Uh, there is a drug that called ivermectin, and I'm sure as uh, reporters, you have heard stories about it, that is used for treating parasitic diseases, not both in animals and in human beings. And the question for repurposing is, can it be used for COVID? Now, the danger that I've seen is that we, when we test that, you, there's some results that you'll get that shows it has some effect. This study shows um, the people who were given it uh, were slightly recovered much quickly than people are not. And then immediately the, the, the world buys that and they say, oh, there is a cure now for COVID. Uh, you don't need to do anything. Uh, and in my own country here, there is even a doctor who unfortunately now has passed on who told, was telling people, oh, don't worry. If you get uh, COVID, there is this drug that is being used, you, you know, and so on and so forth. That is just the preliminary beginning of showing whether the drug is, has some effect uh, against COVID or not. Then you need bigger, wider studies to confirm that, uh, which unfortunately, most of these drugs 
when they go now to the next level of trying to confirm doing in big clinical trials, they have all failed. We tried it with a drug against HIV called Ritonavi. We tried it against uh, Ivermectin. We've tried it against chloroquine and people are still trying and will not stop trying to use repurpose drugs. And hopefully one of these days we'll get one that works. But before we do that, uh, unfortunately, people are misinforming the general population of drugs that work, whereas they don't work. Wonderful, wonderful, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this very, very informative uh, brief. I believe my colleagues have gotten all that they need. And uh, in any case you need anything else, uh, Professor, is, you can reach him anytime, wherever you are, whether in Uganda, Nigeria, or any other country, or here in Kenya. So, Prof, thank you, and thank you, colleagues, from wherever you are, for joining. I personally have learned a lot from this, and I believe you have too. So, uh, Prof, uh, thank you once again, and we are sorry that it has taken more, more than we had uh, promised. We said it would end at um, 12.30, and I can see it's eight minutes past, and I know your time is very precious. You're thank muted. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate this. Uh, it has uh, been a wonderful discussion. And uh, I'm just wishing you all the best as you disseminate this information uh, of, around COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you. And bye bye, everybody.